Um, we've, we've got an excellent set of speakers. Um, I'll call the first one up now, and our first talker is um, Harriet McMillan, who's a psychiatrist and paediatrician conducting family violence research. She's a member of the Offord Centre for Child Studies, professor in the departments of psychiatry and behavioural neuroscience and paediatric med medicine at McMaster's University and holds the David R. Um, Dan Orford Chair in Child Studies. So I'll invite Harriet to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Although I have to say that coming from Canada, I thought it might be a bit warmer. But uh, anyway. <laughs> So what I'm going to be doing today, as outlined on this slide, is really covering that topic for early childhood. So in other words, what do we know about prevention of child maltreatment? And I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, but I would like to make a point about conflict of interest. And I think any of us who are providing an overview of evidence need to disclose any potential conflicts of interest. So for example, in my case, I conduct research on the nurse-family partnership, and I'll be talking about that today. What you need to know, however, is that in systematic reviews that I've done in the past, where I referred to the nurse-family partnership and summarized the evidence, for example, in 1994, that preceded my involvement with evaluation of the NFP directly by 10 years. And I think that's the kind of information that we should all be sharing so that people are clear when you're hearing from people giving an overview as to what other potential conflicts of interest might be beyond financial. So this slide really outlines what I plan to do today. And uh, essentially, what I'll be talking about is what do we know works and what doesn't, and then looking at how can that potentially be applied to low- and middle-income countries. This provides an overview of the types of maltreatment that I'll be covering. The definition here is from WHO. And I'd also like to acknowledge in this presentation the influence from Chris Micton, who's a technical advisor uh, at WHO. He and I prepared a much longer presentation than this on what do we know about pre prevention of child maltreatment that was presented for WHO last January. I've updated it since, and I've been given half the time to give it to you. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly. I will also say that much of what I'm talking about today is outlined in detail in a review in Lancet in 2009. And my colleagues, the authors, are listed in your list of um, <clears throat> publications for this workshop is uh, the paper and it lists the various authors who were involved in this. But Chris and I have since updated this for the presentation that we gave previously. Now, <clears throat> I think everyone here is familiar with the different types of maltreatment I've listed here. Just like to make one comment. You'll be hearing more about intimate partner violence this afternoon, but the way that my colleagues and I conceptualize child maltreatment for that Lancet review and in anything else that we're doing at this point is that exposure to intimate partner violence is a type of child maltreatment with similar types of impairment as the other types. And I think that's an important message. The literature supports that. Now this morning, Mark Rosenberg talked about this public health approach that I've outlined here that of course is very much highlighted by CDC. You heard a lot about the issue of surveillance. I just want to point out a couple of things to you from this slide. So first of all, although we definitely need more surveillance studies, not only in high-income countries, but also in low- and middle-income countries, I would say to you that if you look at the amount of literature that is coming out about issues like prevalence, distribution, determinants of violence, and compare that to what's coming out about interventions, it really is very much sided toward the bottom of this particular uh, scale. So 
I don't think that we need to know everything about one level before we move on to the next. I would, however, say that I think we need to know what works before we implement it. And the area of child maltreatment is indeed a place where there are many programs implemented around the world in high-income countries, certainly where we have the resources to conduct studies, where we have actually put things in place on a widespread scale before we know whether they work or not. And I hope if you take nothing else away from my presentation today, it's the need to understand what works before we scale it up. And I'll give some examples as we go along. I should also say one other point here, and it was raised this morning about the issue of decommissioning. Understanding what doesn't work is as important as what works. And uh, I'll mention some of that in regard to IPV. So uh, Mark already referred to this, the importance of child maltreatment as a risk factor for other types of violence. And then again, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, much of this you've covered, but just to emphasize, we need to think about as we develop programs to prevent child maltreatment, individual risk factors, the relationship factors, and this is very much from the ecological framework, the community factors that you've heard about, and the societal factors. And these slides will be available, and this is from WHO, easily accessible. So I'm not going to go through it quickly because, um, sorry, I am going to go through it quickly. I'm not going to go through it in detail because you've already heard from Mark and others. So <clears throat> on to the topic of prevention. This is a particular framework that I find particularly useful. So a lot of the literature focuses on what do we know about preventing child maltreatment before it happens, both in terms of universal and selected programs. And equally important is the issue of prevention of recurrence and prevention of impairment. And this is where the indicated interventions come in. So I'm actually going to cover all of this today and again, highlight where we have evidence and where we don't. So, <clears throat> and this is really divided up in terms of the different types of maltreatment, recognizing that there can be a lot of overlap across the subtypes. So we do know that there is a lot of overlap between physical abuse and neglect, and many of the programs have been developed with this in mind. Particularly in the case of, for example, um, <clears throat> home visitation, this is very much focused on what is happening within the family. And so already you've heard about the Nurse Family Partnership, and uh, this morning you heard from Mark Lipsy that no one study provides a confident basis for action. And the Nurse Family Partnership is an excellent example of where there have been three randomized trials, and I'll say more about that shortly. The early start a home visiting program in New Zealand. Then there is the category of parent training programs, and the most promising of the parent training programs is Triple P. Abuse of head trauma education, also promising, and enhanced pediatric care such as SEEK, de developed by Dubowitz and colleagues. Now, <clears throat> the language that I'm using here is very much what we used in our Lancet review. So you'll notice, for example, I've characterized projects such as best evidence and promising. Very much in line with what you heard from Patrick Tolan, the idea that just on the basis of one randomized trial, even if it's very good, we have to ask ourselves, does that then lead to implementation on a widespread scale? I think you would agree not, but we have lots of examples, particularly in the US where indeed that's happened. So, some key issues with respect to home visiting. Home visiting often gets lumped together, and if you look at the systematic review that just came out from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force yesterday on the issue of interventions in child maltreatment, they have very much lumped home visiting programs together, which quite frankly, I think is a mistake, because I think there are major differences between these various programs that have to be taken into account. I think it's like lumping antibiotics together. And uh, I think we really need to look at the specifics of it. You heard earlier about the role for meta-analysis. Absolutely. 
but we have to be clear where combining studies is problematic. So a key message here, we must not assume that any home visiting program is effective in reducing child abuse and neglect, and that is often what's happened, and I'm saying that on the basis of systematic reviews as well as RCTs. So I indicated earlier that the Nurse Family Partnership is the best evidence, and let me just take you through that. So I think many people in the room may be familiar with this, but it's a program that targets first-time socially disadvantaged mothers where the home visiting begins prenatally and extends until the child is two years of age. The nurse focuses on the three aspects of maternal functioning as outlined on this slide. These are the three trials. So <clears throat> David Olds conducted in 1977 the Elmira trial, as you can see here, the numbers, the type of sample. And even though he got benefits, such as reduction of child maltreatment, he didn't stop there. He said, this is only one study. We should not impl implement it. In fact, it wasn't called the Nurse Family Partnership then. But we shouldn't implement this on the basis of one trial. We really need to see the extent to which it's generalizable. Then came the Memphis, Tennessee study, and then the Denver, Colorado study. <clears throat> now, just a point about the Denver, Colorado study. There had been, and I'll say more about this, a real emphasis on the use of providers other than nurses, what are called paraprofessionals or lay home visitors by some. And so in the Denver trial, David and colleagues compared nurses to paraprofessionals to a control group. They found that paraprofessionals got results that were about half that of nurses. And from that point on, David and colleagues said, we're going to continue implementing the NFP, but with nurses. So what's the evidence of effectiveness for the Nurse Family Partnership? It extends well beyond the issue of child maltreatment, but I'm going to focus on this particular area. So as you can see here, reduced child physical abuse and neglect, and this is as measured by one of the toughest outcomes. We know that official reports are the tip of the iceberg, and at 15 years out, in other words, when the child who was visited was 15 years old, there were important differences in reports of child abuse and neglect. In addition, there were what we would refer to as proxy outcomes, such as reduction in injuries in children. So that's the Nurse Family Partnership, best evidence. I'm going to move on to Early Start, New Zealand program. And in this particular program, where the interveners are nurses, or social workers. Again, we see reduced associated outcomes such as injuries and hospital admissions. There's just been one randomized trial, which is why we refer to it as promising, and it needs replication. What about the issue of paraprofessional home visiting? So this includes the Hawaii Healthy Start program, which was the foundation for Healthy Families America. And as you can see here, they haven't been shown effective to date in reducing child protection reports. And recent trials have shown conflicting evidence with regard to maternal self-reported child abuse. I just want to make a point about this issue of outcomes and self-reports. As much as possible, we need to use outcomes that are not in the case of parenting programs, where the parents report on their own behavior. Once they've been through a program, they know what's to be expected. So you can have a really well-designed trial in terms of the way it's set up, the sampling. If the outcomes aren't appropriate, then you're not going to get the kind of information you need. I'll just say one more thing about a home visitation program that you may hear about. It uh, was referred to in the systematic review that came out in Annals yesterday from the US-affiliated uh, um, um, uh, center that conducts the systematic reviews, and that's the Child First program. Uh, this is a home-based psychotherapeutic program, and it does have hold some promise in preventing child maltreatment. It was shown to reduce um, involvement with the child protection system. But again, uh, some methodologic limitations and needs much more work. So now on to Triple P. Again, I think many of you are familiar with this. And as I said, the details are outlined in our Lancet review. So when the results of this study came out, very much highlighted the positive effects, as you can see here, 
but we identified problems with the analysis and uh, again one study but it started spreading across North America and one of the issues is people say well but there are many many studies of triple P out there yes but not looking at reduction of child maltreatment and that's a key issue uh, <clears throat> I would say that uh, before moving on to abusive head trauma that uh, systematic review just came out from Wilson in um, uh, biomedical medicine and uh, it pointed out also that there were problems in that particular study so those of us who were involved with the review would characterize it as promising but certainly not definitive and not warranting widespread dissemination I'm going to go through the next set of slides really quickly because I think that they have similar themes. So again, abusive head trauma, as outlined here, promising. Enhanced pedi pediatric care, SEEK, which involves putting additional resources into clinics so people look for risk factors for child maltreatment, and it involves a social worker with the family. Again, promising. So you can see lots of promising things, but they need to be evaluated. So I finished physical abuse and neglect. I'm going to move on to sexual abuse, and I can summarize that really quickly for you. Lots of these types of programs out there, they improve knowledge. Do we actually know if they prevent sexual abuse? The answer is no. Shouldn't we be finding out if these programs, where we spend millions of dollars getting these out there, whether they actually work or not? I would suggest yes. Emotional abuse, again, you'll notice a particular theme here. There is some prom, uh, promise for what are called attachment-based interventions. They may improve insensitive parenting, but we have no direct evidence that they actually prevent emotional abuse. Exposure to IPV, you're going to be hearing more about that, but um, certainly one of the issues that's come up is this whole idea of screening. So if we prevent IPV, intimate partner violence, excuse the acronym, among uh, caregivers, we would prevent it for children if we screen. In fact, there are two randomized trials. I admit conflict of interest. I led one of them showing no evidence of effectiveness for IPV screening in reducing violence or reducing health outcomes. But the U.S. task force came out in favor in this, um, as did IOM, by the way. So I probably won't get invited back again, but I just needed to put that out there. <laughs> so, preventing recurrence and impairment. I think many of you have heard about safe care, structural behavioral skills, home-based training program. Uh, <clears throat> it's been shown to reduce recidivism compared with usual home-based services. Again, promising. Needs to be replicated. In terms of preventing the recurrence of physical abuse and neglect, Parent-child interaction therapy, widespread. One high-quality randomized trial needs to be replicated. By the way, the trial that is referred to at the bottom of the slide, nurse home visitation, and by the way, that is not the nurse-family partnership. That's a trial, again, conflict of interest acknowledged that my colleagues and I did in Canada, and it was looking at preventing recurrence of physical abuse and neglect and was found not to be effective. So I think you see I have no trouble acknowledging when things aren't effective. What about specific types of maltreatment? As outlined here, we know very little about how to prevent recurrence of neglect. Once there's a neglectful pattern going on, it's really hard to know what to do about that. But again, there is evidence that safe care seems to reduce the recurrence of child maltreatment generally, so it may have specific effects on neglect, but we need to look into that further. And you can see, as outlined here, we really don't know much about preventing recurrence of other types of maltreatment. Now, what about impairment? We've got some good news here. There is evidence for cognitive behavior therapy in reducing internalizing and externalizing symptoms. But here is the important point. Among children with PTSD symptoms, what that means is it isn't for all children simply because they've been exposed to sexual abuse or any other type of maltreatment. 
it's based on their symptoms. So here again, very important caveat. And uh, I've outlined here what some of the elements of these programs are. Impairment following IPV exposure. There is some promise that community trauma-focused CBT does reduce children's symptoms again, but replication is required and some evidence for what's called mother-child therapy. And then a word about out-of-home care, foster care, often not thought about as a type of intervention in the context of prevention, but in fact, and uh, somewhere in one of the other rooms is one of me, my colleagues from the Lancet manuscript, uh, Heather Tausig, who took the lead in summarizing this evidence for that review. There is evidence that enhanced foster care can lead to better mental health outcomes. And uh, there's conflicting evidence about kinship care compared with traditional foster care. But Heather and others, they've done work showing that when you remove children from an abusive or neglectful situation and have them placed in an out-of-home um, situation, that those children who remain in those circumstances do better than those that are returned home. So that was in one study. There's been other studies. You'll see here observational studies that support that. So here's an example of where, ethically, we're probably never going to have a randomized trial, OK? So I've talked a lot about randomized trials, really important. But we also have to acknowledge when a randomized trial is not appropriate. By the same token, I think what we don't want to do is say, we can't do a randomized trial in those circumstances where we can. So the example I gave you of where my colleagues and I tested a very specific type of home visitation by nurses in the child welfare system, people said to us, that can't be done. And we did it. We basically compared those who got usual care through the child welfare system with a very intense, enhanced program. Now, it wasn't effective, which is unfortunate, but it speaks to the level of difficulty in intervening once certain patterns of behavior are established. But nevertheless, it showed you can do a randomized trial in those circumstances. So let's be clear. When can we do them and when can't we? And just not assume that because we're working in the area of violence that we can't do randomized trials. So evidence from low and middle income countries. So I can actually summarize this <clears throat> very quickly. Um, and indeed, as you can see here, this is a slide from a report by Chris Micton and Alex Bouchard at WHO. And this is really to show you just the paucity of evaluations that come from countries other than the USA. So <clears throat> they did a systematic review of reviews. And you can see here that basically 99% um, of the studies were uh, carried out in high income countries. 83% um, <clears throat> of those were in the US. And none of these were in low-income countries. So it gives you a sense of, um, and what they did was they gathered this information from the 298 outcome evaluations that formed the basis for their systematic review. So it just speaks to some of the difficulties. Colombia and China, you can see here, just again, and the 83% for the US. Now, I want to refer quickly to a systematic review by Kinnair that was done. This wasn't looking only at child maltreatment. It was looking at, I know, she's giving me the time. <laughs> she's hanging up the, the uh, slides, don't worry. Um, so here they looked at uh, parenting and prevention of child maltreatment. And what they found, uh, as you can see here, 12 studies conducted in nine countries. But again, a real emphasis on middle-income countries. So there were just two studies that were done in what's considered a low-income country, which is Ethiopia. So it really speaks to the paucity of information that we have from um, low- and middle-income evaluations. Uh, I would say that a key question is the extent to which we can take what we know from 
evaluations in high income countries and extrapolate to low and middle income countries. And you can see here on point number five, use and adapt evidence-based high income programs or develop a new. There is some thinking that we should use and adapt because there's so much effort that goes into developing these programs. Other people say, well, how are we ever going to get the funds to actually do the research? But there is increasingly effort put into conducting surveillance in low and middle income countries. Why should it only be about surveillance? Shouldn't it also be about evaluation of interventions? So these are some of the questions that I hope um, <clears throat> that we can talk about during the, during the question period. And again, just to emphasize, I think we need to take action in low middle income countries as well as high income countries, but it needs to be based on evidence. Thank you very much.